Gene Ichimaru is one of Bleach's most enduringly beloved and iconic characters, even long after his death at the end of the Arankar arc. In this video, the second character analysis video we're doing on the channel, I want to take a deep dive look at the traitorous captain of the third division who eventually tried to kill Aizen and retrieve what he believed that Matsumoto had stolen from her all that time ago. Gin is a very, very popular character and he's been in the series for a very long time. His first appearance was chapter 65 and he was in the series all the way until his death in chapter 417, but he even managed to sneak in some new appearances in the Thousand Year Blood War arc in the Everything But The Rain flashback, which was nice to see. Before we get started on this video, guys, if you haven't seen the video we did on Kisuke Urahara on this channel, please do check it out. Um, and hopefully you'll enjoy that analysis of that character as well. Both of these characters are similar in many ways, actually. They're incredibly popular, both very mysterious, both very powerful, um, and both very much synonymous with Bleach as a franchise. In the comments last time, I asked you guys to post who you would like to see a video on next, and Gein was the winner. I counted up all the votes that were on there, and he came out on top. There were a couple of people who were pretty close behind, however. This time, though, I want to do things a little differently. I'm going to be posting three characters uh, as pinned comments in the uh, comment section below. Just put vote under which one you'd like to see next. I'm kind of hoping it'll make the whole process a little bit easier for me um, to work out who to do an analysis video on next. Um, but yeah, this time we are looking at Gein, one of Bleach's most recognisable villains. If you can even really call him a villain. Well, that's the sort of thing we're going to dive into in this video. Before we begin, however, if you are new to the channel, that goal of 10,000 subscribers is looking ever more doable. So if you haven't hit subscribe already, you are in the right place for Bleach videos every week. So make sure you hit that button now and help us reach that milestone. I've also got a Twitter account where you can follow me for updates on the latest videos. And we have a Discord, which the uh, invite link is in the description below. Um, and you can join a really cool community of Bleach fans who love the series and frankly can't wait for the anime to come back. Don't forget as well, hit the like button, help the exposure of the video, and hit the notification bell just to make sure you don't miss any of these videos in the future. So, Gin Ichimaru, simultaneously one of the creepiest characters and one of the most loved characters in Bleach, there's no denying that. I remember uh, an old interview Kubo had where he was surprised by Gin's popularity, especially among women, as he had tried to make this guy appear really creepy and really off-putting, and you can totally see that in his face. Um, Gein has this perpetual expression on his face where his eyes are closed and his mouth is just kind of turned upwards in this very devilish smile. He kind of looks a bit like a fox, you know, supposed to be very cunning, very sly. The idea is you're never supposed to have any clue what this guy is really thinking, and that is reflected throughout his entire personality and throughout his entire appearance as well. It goes beyond just the facial expression. Even his dialect and the way he speaks, both in the Japanese sub and the English dub, are designed to disguise his true feelings and intentions. He speaks very sarcastically, very lightheartedly, and you're never supposed to know what this guy is really thinking. He is a true snake in the grass. Not only that, but it's reflected in his outfits as well. Even when he joins the Iran cars and he gains an entirely new outfit, his new outfit has massive sleeves designed to hide his hands. Again, very like Sun Sun, the other snake-like character. This guy, you're never supposed to know when he's coming. You're not supposed to see what he's up to. And he could be doing anything. He's supposed to have a very sinister nature to him. And I frankly think that Gein is one of Kubo's best designed characters from a visual standpoint. There's no getting around that. Um, the combination of his facial expression and just his overall mannerisms have made him one of Bleach's most recognisable characters. And there's obvious reasons for that. I do think in the Soul Society arc, Kubo plays up his facial expressions a lot more. They're drawn with a considerable sharpness to them because he's supposed to be playing the role of the central bad guy. And that was honestly what really attracted me to him when I first started reading and watching Bleach. Gein was my favourite character in the series for a very long time because I just totally loved this guy's attitude, but I loved the shadowy nature of his character as well. He always had this grin on his face. You had no idea what was going on. And I just, I loved that. I thought it was really, really well done. And Kubo's sharp drawings of him in the Soul Society arc are some of the best Gein ever looks in the series. As you move into the Arankar arc, Kubo softens the way he draws Gein. There's no denying that. He has less angular features. His mouth is no longer in such a almost Joker-esque grin. 
And I think this is probably done conscientiously. Obviously, the art style between the Soul Society arc and the Aranka arc grows less angular. But I think Gein's facial features are supposed to change to represent the fact that his motivations are slowly coming to light. He is obviously no longer the main villain by this point, Eisen is. And Gein is very much working in the background for a very long time. So I think now's a great time actually to get into his role overview, as I think Gein plays a interesting, if very understated, role in the story. Gein is actually one of the first captains ever introduced in the series, alongside Byakuya and Kenpachi in the Agent of the Shinigami arc, and he's very much played up for laughs in this scene. He, like, wraps up Kenpachi and tries to pull him away from a possible confrontation, and it's only really when we get to the Soul Society arc that he begins to take centre stage, and he really is at the forefront of the story in this arc, and I really like that because... As popular as Gein is, he never has such a big role to play ever again. That's a big shame, in my opinion, because this guy was very underused. And I know you can kind of say that for the majority of the Bleach cast, but Gein really was underused. He, I, I think purposefully to keep that air of mystique about his character. But as someone who always really liked Gein, I feel like I always wanted to see more from him. And that's especially going to become apparent when we get to his battles section. When the Soul Society arc rolls around, Gein is the first captain Ichigo and his friends meet, and obviously he very quickly dispatches of Jidambo and Ichigo with his weapon Shinso. Um, and you get the brilliant juxtaposition of his personality where he's incredibly sinister. One of my favourite lines Gein ever has is where he says something like, oh, you know, gatekeepers aren't supposed to open gates. A gatekeeper who, who opens a gate dies, and then that is so light-hearted but so evil at the same time you know he's very very menacing but then as soon as they're out the door again he's like bye bye and like that is one of his most iconic moments i think hands down ever probably one of the most iconic bleach moments ever is Gein's little bye bye as the gate shuts on them again and it's just that really nice contrast between who he really is and who he kind of projects on the outside again very similar to kisuke urahara who we spoke about last time um, but Gein, I think it, the, the juxtaposition is sharper. It definitely leans heavier into the evil side. He's, in my opinion, Gein has never really been portrayed as a good person apart from in his earliest days with Rangiku when they were kids. That's the only time he's ever really portrayed as a good person, and maybe at the very end as well. We'll get to that, obviously. So with the Soul Society arc in full bloom and Ichigo and his friends arriving uh, in the Seirei Tei to try and rescue Rukia, you get the whole conspiracy plot around Gein and Aizen possibly having some falling out and then Aizen ends up dead and Kubo does really good stuff in this arc. The story is obviously very well paced, very well told, clearly plotted and planned out, uh, which is something that the future arcs definitely suffer from a little bit, but, you know, Gein is highlighted as the main suspect of who killed Aizen. That's the big mystery of the Soul Society arc, and you're very much supposed to think that Gein is the one who did this. And Gein is obviously playing up to this idea because he, he he's in on the secret plan with Aizen. And you get a nice antagonistic relationship between him and Hitsugaya in this arc, because obviously Hitsugaya is caring for Momo, and he's he thinks that Gein is tormenting her with all the Aizen stuff, and... It's interesting because obviously once Aizen is revealed to be the central bad guy, Hitsugaya and Gein don't ever interact again, I don't think, which is kind of weird. Um, especially when you consider Gein's closeness to Rangiku, and like I said, the fact that Gein and Hitsugaya have such an antagonistic relationship in this first arc that takes up a, you know, a decent chunk of this arc and culminates them in, in fighting them fighting. They never speak again, I don't think, after this arc, which is kind of weird, but it, it, in my opinion, that's one of the many things that showed Gein's paired back role after the Soul Society arc and that he no longer even warrants an antagonistic relationship with someone like Hitsugaya because that focus is now on Aizen of course so yeah so Gein's shining moments really do come for the most part in the Soul Society arc obviously he does get a big moment towards the end of the Aranka arc but it's the Soul Society arc where Gein really stands out I think that's where he makes his impression and luckily it's a very powerful impression at that um, he doesn't really ever fight anyone. He does briefly fight Hitsugaya. Uh, and when I say brief, I mean brief. You do get to see Hiori and Mario for the first time. And it leads to a really cool moment where Hitsugaya freezes Gein's arm. 
Gein opens his eyes for the first ever time and he tries to fire Shinso, Hitsugaya dodges, but it's going towards Hinamori and Rangiku arrives to save her. But that's the extent, really, of Gein's fighting in this arc, and it doesn't get much better than that, either. Like, Gein doesn't really do anything in terms of battles later, but we'll get into that. We'll, we'll get into that in a bit. So, that's the main... His major role in the Soul Society arc is to play the role of the main villain, until Aizen is revealed to be the villain, at which point Gein takes a back seat, which lasts, essentially, until he dies, unfortunately. And that is a real shame, um, but that, like I said, everything he does do in the Soul Society arc, I absolutely love. I love his personality. I think he was absolutely the right character to make the pseudo main bad guy because he does come across as very evil, very shady. You don't know what's up with this guy. And I think it worked really, really well. When he attempts to escape the Soul Society, you obviously get that moment with him and Rangiku where he says sorry. I remember the fan base just going nuts over that like we had no idea no idea why he was saying sorry was it as simple as i'm sorry i'm evil i'm sorry i've t gone with eisen it turns out to be obviously completely different to that but that was one of the big mysteries of the series that we wondered if we would ever find out um and i think that the uh, the english dub actually ruins that line <laughs> uh in the english dub he says something like maybe next time which doesn't make any sense, really, with, with what we find out in the future. But yeah, so that's pretty much him in the Soul Society arc. Moving on to the Aranka arc, which, as we've discussed before, is a bloated arc. It's very, very long. And Gein, of all the characters, is really pushed into the background. I, 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 you know, considering his prominence in the Soul Society arc, it's actually kind of jarring. And like I said, as a fan of Gein, I was like, where is this guy? He's not done anything for ages. Um, he gets the occasional moment with Aizen where he talks about Aizen's plans, Aizen's feelings, which is quite interesting. Um, and it's something we'll get into in his relationships. But Gein plays a frankly tertiary role in the Wakamundo arc especially. Um, but all throughout the Aranka arc, he is barely seen. We find out that he's moving the corridors around um, in the uh, in Last Notches so that certain people find certain opponents and stuff like that. But that's really the extent of what he does. We then move to the fake Karakura Town arc, and you might be thinking, okay, the main villains are actually going to fight the Gote. Now is Gein's time to shine. Well, no, not really. Once again, Gein somehow gets away with doing absolutely nothing in this arc. Obviously, he's trapped by Joe Kaku Enjo at the start of the fight, uh, which, that's fair. That puts him out of the battle. But then, when he's free... You don't see him do anything. Kubo off-screens a fight between him and Shinji, which I think is very disappointing. I remember... I actually remember that chapter really well. Um, because I remember people being very unhappy with that. I remember Aizen says something like, um, that's enough, Gein. And we we see for the first ever time that Gein was squaring off with Shinji. And it's like, what? Why haven't you shown us this fight? I remember that. I remember people being really unhappy about that. But... Gein, again, does literally nothing until Hiori attempts to rush Aizen. And then I remember being completely blown away by this moment. Gein just cuts her in half with Shinzo. And in the manga, it is a full, clean cut in half. There's a really, really cool panel where you get a close-up of her eye. And you see her legs, like, way behind her. And, and I, remember, I remember thinking, like, this is the goriest thing I've ever seen in Bleach. And, like... We've obviously seen people take serious damage before. Like Ichigo gets a hole blown through him, you know, um, and stuff like that. But actually showing like her legs in a different part position to her body, I was like, how are they going to do this in the anime? And then it turned out that they just stabbed her through the gut. But whatever. It was really cool. Game was like, you know, one down. And he actually just kind of came out of nowhere to cut her in half like that. And then he's relegated again <laughs> for, for ages. He... I love the fact that Gein just comes out of nowhere to cut Hiori down and you basically don't see him again for ages. I'm like, okay, does Kubo have nothing for this character to do? So that was a big shame. But then Gein does start to have some importance again. One thing I did like about Gein's involvement in this arc is that Kubo clearly meant for him to be the secondary antagonist because he survives beyond the Espada. He survives way beyond Tosin. And eventually gets involved in the major battles with Ichigo and Ishin and Aizen, etc. I think this section with him fighting Ichigo at the start of the Deicide arc uh, is probably 
the most telling. I think this is probably when Kubo was really trying to lay on thick the hints about Gein's true motives, because like I said, through this whole time, you're really supposed to have no idea about what Gein actually wants from any of this. Um, the most we've ever really had regarding his flashbacks is that he spent some time with Matsumoto as a little kid. Um, in terms of the pendulum arc, he was recruited into the 5th Division by Aizen. We know he's a prodigy as well. Um, even as a child, he was like murdering the third seat and stuff like that. But he's not really done anything outside of being Aizen's lackey. During Term at the Pendulum, he was apparently interested in holification experimentation with Aizen and Tozen, despite the fact he was a kid. So, but we know the reason why he was doing that. We find that out right at the very end, which I thought was really cool. But for now, Gein is fighting Ichigo, and we finally get to see his Bankai, which is Kamishini no Yari, um, which is something I want to talk about in a little bit more detail in a moment. But he fights Ichigo. It's a decent fight. Um, but again, with Gein, you only ever get the most sort of tantalising teases of an actual battle. Um, it's the same as against Hitsugaya. He barely fights back until the end when you get to see the briefest of flashes of Shinzo in action. Um, and now against Ichigo, yeah, he is doing a little bit more. Um, but considering he's a prodigy, I think people expected him to get an actual fight. And he's, you know, the main, the second main villain. He's Aizen's right-hand guy. But Kubo had different plans for Gein, and he does fight Ichigo for a decent amount of time. They have some cool choreography in their battle, but the reality of this fight is Gein is testing Ichigo's metal to eventually go up against Aizen, and I think that's really, really cool. Gein is planning way ahead. We know that Ichigo can cross swords with somebody and, like, sense how they're feeling inside, um, and he says that he he can't feel what Gein is feeling because Gein is not looking at him. And that was... I think probably the big giveaway that Gein was planning on betraying Aizen at some point, Gein is looking f at Aizen, that's his end game, that's his final goal. And I thought that was really nicely done by Kubo. Uh, and the whole Gein training Ichigo stuff is really cool. Like, you get a really good look at Ichigo's mindset in this battle, and, you know, what he's the only one who can sense Aizen's true power, and obviously Ichigo thinks that's a bad thing. Gein knows that that means that Ichigo can fight Aizen. Um, but when Ichigo's like, we can't win, and Gein, Gein's just like, run. But um, that is a cool moment, though, because Gein is like, you can't kill him. I can. And if you're not going to do this, then I will try and do it. And Gein knows fully well that he's going into this, risking his life. And he would obviously like Ichigo, probably, I'd assume, to be able to fight him as well. Or, or I, I would assume that what Gein wants is that if Gein dies, he, think, he thinks there's a good chance he will die... Ichigo will be there to pick up the slack. Um, and if Ichigo's not going to do that, then Gein's like, well, just get out of here then, because I'll do it myself. Um, and then Ichigo obviously says something along the lines of like, you know, if Aizen has become like that without your knowledge, then how do you know what's going to happen to you in the future? Because Aizen is clearly not sharing everything with you like you thought he was. Um, but then the fight essentially ends because Aizen escapes from his cocoon stage and they go to the real Karakura town. And then we get to the finale of Gein's storyline, and Matsumoto arrives in Karakura Town to stop him, and you're supposed to think that he has killed her off, off screen, he takes her away from Aizen, but in reality he's just used Hakufuku on her to knock her out while he attempts to finish things with Aizen once and for all. So he attempts to assassinate Aizen using his Bankai Kamishini no Yari. Um, and Aizen is, of course, in a transcended state at this point. He's not quite his most powerful form, but he is strong enough to the point where he is melting human beings just by walking past them. So Gein's chances for victory here were always going to be slim, but he does manage to create a massive hole in Aizen's chest, take the Hogyoku for himself. I don't know what that was all about, if he wanted to somehow destroy the Hogyoku, maybe. Um, but he does say that with this, it's now all over. So I assume... You know what? I would like a what-if scenario where he returns to fake Karakura Town. Like, Aizen is actually dead. He returns to fake Karakura Town. He's like, I've got the Hogyoku, it's all over, Aizen's dead. I was actually not on his side all along. But obviously that doesn't happen. The Hogyoku forces an evolution on Aizen. Aizen comes back to life, and he brutally murders Gein. And that's basically it. Like, Rangiku arrives, and she's all incredibly upset, and it is incredibly emotional, it's very well done, it's reminiscent in a way of Okiora's death in terms of how emotionally resonant it actually is, 
Um, I included Gein's death on my top five best death scenes in the series because it really is that good. It's powerful. It's cool seeing Rangiku just like losing it over his body. And Gein, finally, we discover why he apologized to her because basically in the past, when they were little kids and they lived together in like a little shack, Gein spotted Aizen and his cronies attempting to build a Hogyoku. And they were obviously carving people's souls away to make it. And Gein discovers that they've destroyed his house and they've obviously beaten up Matsumoto a bit and they've taken a part of her soul to feed into Aizen's Hogyoku. So Gein, for the entire series, has been trying to find the perfect moment to kill Aizen. And unlike everyone else, he knows the weakness of Kyokusui Getsu, that if you hold the blade before activation, you will not be put under its spell. Now, Gein explicitly says that Aizen told him this weakness, and you get a you get a flashback, and it's kind of weird, because Gein says, how many decades did it take to get you to finally tell me that secret? And when you see, when he says that, you see Gein as a little kid, and Aizen as a captain. So, it's obviously some moment just after Turn Back the Pendulum, but it does make you wonder, like, why did Gein wait so long? You know, if Ge why didn't Gein just kill Aizen back when Aizen was just a captain? Like, obviously Aizen was incredibly powerful, you know, ridiculously so, and on a level that Gein understands better than anyone else. But we've seen here that Gein's Bankai Kamishin no Yari is a one-hit kill. Like, if Aizen didn't have the Hogyoku embedded in his body, that poison would have destroyed his heart and he would be dead. So, Gein's timing does seem to leave a little bit to be desired. I appreciate that he didn't have an awful lot of opportunities, but I think, like, you know, in Wake Mundo, he could have just done it. The whole him turning against the Soul Society to kill Aizen plotline, I always really enjoyed it, but I just think it it's a little bit wishy-washy, if that makes sense. Like, why even turn against the Soul Society? You know, if, if, if Gein's only ambition is to kill Aizen in revenge for Matsumoto then why not just do it with the Soul Society? You know, why not just why not just tell them what Aizen's up to and then they, you know, they'll they'll execute him themselves. And I think a lot of that comes down to Gein's personality. And I think his personality is a flaw at the end of the day. Despite Gein's intentions to kill Aizen, he is still a villain in this series. You know, he doesn't have to cut Hiori in half, but he does it anyway. And I know some people have always said that, well, Gein was doing that to protect her from Aizen. Well, I don't know if Aizen would necessarily have just cut her in half like that. Maybe he would have done. I don't know. Maybe he would have done. Um, but, you know, there are other things that Gein does as well that make him to be a bad guy. Like when he openly goes to Rukia and, and gives her false hope and then mocks her completely for that. You know, these things don't add up to a nice person, no matter how noble his overall intentions were. And I think that boils down to why he didn't kill Aizen at a better, more opportune moment. Where Gein was concerned, he, t he seemed to take great pleasure from the fact that he was the only one who knew how to kill Aizen. Um, he says something like, you know, oh, I was a lot of fun watching the Soul Society try and kill you, but reality, I'm the only one who can do it. And so he, it seems he was breeding Ichigo to be like his contingency plan, but he didn't want to let anyone else have the glory of taking out the guy that he had set his eyes on from the very beginning. So Gein's undoing, I think, does come down to his own personality at the end of the day. He was blinded by trying to do this thing for Matsumoto, but he was clearly, you know, not the most stable of guys. He was obviously very self-absorbed, but also, you know, very selfish. Um, everything he did that wasn't for Matsumoto paints a picture of someone who is immoral you know he's not a very nice person regardless of his overall intentions so i've always been puzzled when people say that you know gein's actually a good guy because i don't think he is I, at best he's an anti-hero um but really i've always seen him as a villain with one noble intention that's basically it i think um but the moment he dies is obviously very very well done um his last look at ichigo through dying eyes drawn amazingly in the manga and adapted fantastically in the anime and he's obviously so powerless at this point that he can't speak and he you know he thinks like you know those eyes those eyes are finally ready you're finally able to take my place i can die 
and leave this all to you. And that's just so good. And it's so such good uh, payoff for their little fight. Not, you know, a volume ago, but it's really, really well done that Ichigo has finally arrived at a place where Gein is like, yeah, that's where I wanted you to be earlier. Um, but now I can leave this in your hands. And that's that's fantastically well done. And that's pretty much Gein Ichimaru's plot uh, role. You know, he doesn't do anything for a huge portion of the series. He makes a huge impact early on and he makes a huge impact right at the end. And he doesn't do much else apart from that. I just want to briefly discuss Gein's death as I know a lot of people have taken a lot of issue with this. One of the big criticisms of Bleach from the fan base over the years has been that there's there's been a trope where good characters tend to be able to survive multiple fatal injuries, um, but the villains die from considerably less damage. And a lot of people have said that applies to Gein, and honestly, I couldn't disagree more. You have to remember that by the time Gein died, Aizen was in his, what, third stage of transcendence evolution? Like, at this point, the guy was a demigod. Um, he had gone way beyond just melting normal humans with his Reiatsu to the point where no one could feel his power anymore. So it's honestly fairly impressive that Gein survives as long as he does after what Aizen does to him, and it's not a simple sword slash either. Aizen properly cleaves Gein down the front, um, and then he and like pulls out his arm and then he stabs him through the gut and throws him through a wall and it's like all of this is being done to Gein by someone who is no longer just a Shinigami he is basically a god uh so the fact that Gein is even alive in time for Ichigo to arrive I always thought was pretty impressive um but yeah Gein gets wrecked by someone who is like two times three times maybe even more at this point stronger than an average captain so I never thought it was too unfair Looking at Gein's battles then, and honestly I don't think this section is going to take that long, he really doesn't get many fights at all, and like I said, I think it's because Kubo wanted to preserve some mystique around this character, but it is weirdly handled. He's so popular and yet he doesn't really get any time to properly shine. He has a very, very, very brief skirmish with Ichigo at the start of the Soul Society arc, then he has a fight with Hitsugaya, which is again incredibly short, and for the most part it seems like Gein's not even really trying. Hitsugaya uses Hyorin Maru for the first ever time, freezes Gein's arm, and you get the very cool moment where Gein opens his eyes and shoots Shinso, but that's basically the end of the fight. So Gein does nothing really in terms of battles in the Soul Society arc, when there are huge fights going on all around them, he doesn't really get one at all. Fast forward way forward into the Aranka arc, into the fake Karakura Town arc, and again, like I said, Kubo skips over the fight with Shinji entirely. That never happens. So the only battle you get is Gein versus Ichigo round two. And yeah, it's decent. Like I said, you get to see Gein's Bankai, Kamishini no Yari, for the first time. And I just want to say that when I was reading this weekly, Gein's initial Bankai reveal was one of the most disappointing moments of Bleach I have ever read in my entire life. Like, like I said before, Gein was one of my favourite characters, and when he said Bankai at the end of chapter 399, I think, I can't remember exactly, I was like, oh my god, finally we're gonna see what Shinso's Bankai is, and I had some crazy ideas going through my head that there'd be like some big snake-like thing, similar to maybe Hihio Zabimaru, but obviously stronger. And then next week came around, and this was again during Kubo's most self-indulgent period where he was just drawing chapters that had basically nothing happen in them. The entire chapter pretty much was dedicated to Gein activating his Bankai and then doing one attack with it. So he basically, he, he activated his Bankai. It was just a really, really, really long sword. Swung it, swung it at Ichigo and Ichigo blocks it and hits Gein. And I was like, that's it. You know, his Bankai is just a really, really long sword and it's already been blocked. However, Kubo did a really cool thing with Gein's Bankai where he actually added layers to it throughout the rest of the entire arc. And he used Gein as an unreliable narrator to actually make us question what Kamishini no Yari was really all about. And I thought that was really cool. When he did things like, oh, you know, it can extend and contract 500 times faster than that. It can go... He gave uh, Ichigo like some arbitrary number about how long the Bankai was then revealed to Aizen that basically none of that was true. Its real main ability is to turn to dust for a single fraction of a second, 
once it has stabbed someone and then leave a piece of itself inside that person and secrete a fatal poison. So in the end, Kamishini no Yari was actually really cool and it had abilities like Buto and Buto Renjin, which I liked a lot as well. Not the flashiest of swords ever, but pretty cool nonetheless and very fitting for Gein, especially Kubo goes very hard with the snake imagery, uh, with the final ability, kill Kamishini no Yari, which he uses on Aizen. Um, and clearly very potent because Aizen's, again, like I said, evolved by that point and it still breaks his body apart like it's nothing. So, yeah, in the end, I really liked Gein Zanpakuto, even if his battles did leave a little bit to be desired. His fight with Ichigo's not bad. Um, and his, his personality does shine through in that battle, like the one moment where he's behind Ichigo and he's like... I've got you, and he's like, oh, forget it. I'm just going to sit down for a while. I really, really liked that. I thought that was really, really cool. Um, but considering Gein was a prodigy and actually said to be a prodigy, I definitely wanted to see a bit more from him. Um, but, you know, he gets some nice moments. Like when he clashes with Ichigo a lot, and he's like, oh, your sword's really strong. It feels like mine's going to break. And Ichigo's like, oh, well, just go ahead and let it break then. That's a nice little moment. And it's cool that Gein gets to fight the main character. You know, it's... It's never going to be as flashy as Ulkior or Grim Joe, but it's a good fight nonetheless. And Gein definitely gets shafted in the battles department, but I like what we see. And finally, if we just look, take a look at Gein's most prominent relationships in the series, he doesn't have many. And that is, again, very much in character. Gein is very much a insular person. As he says, he is a cold-blooded snake. Um, he has nothing in the way of emotions or feelings. He just sees something he likes and he devours it whole. Really, really cool. And it's just such a cool way of summing up Gein in a single single sentence, essentially. Um, but his obvious most prominent relationship is that of his childhood relationship with Rangiku Matsumoto. Now, is there anything romantic between them? If I'm being completely honest, I think they're just incredibly close childhood friends, family even, from the fact that they've grown up with basically nobody else. Um, back when they lived in their little hut, Gein was like, when's your birthday? Matsumoto's like, I don't, I don't, what is a birthday? And Gein says, oh, you know, we'll say that the day we met is your birthday. All this sort of thing is very, very well done. And the fact that Gein's story comes full circle for Matsumoto is really nice. The nature of the man he becomes means that he has to be cold and distant with her. Which is, you know, really sad when you think about it. When they finally talk again after Aizen's betrayal, Gein is so short with her. If anything, you get the impression that he is mad that she is meddling with his plan that he has never told her about. Obviously, he hasn't told her that he plans on one day trying to kill Aizen for her. But when she shows up to stop him because she can't understand why he would do this, he's like, you're in the way. Like, get out of the way. I, I don't want you here. It's dangerous you here. But she has no idea that he feels that way, really. As far as she's concerned, he's just turned evil for apparently no reason. So it's a really nice contrast. I feel like Kubo does a decent job of showcasing Gein's inner turmoil when it comes to Matsumoto. You know, he openly lies to Eyes and he says, oh, I've killed her. And Eisen's like, oh, really? I thought you had more feelings for that one and Gein's like well you know I don't have feelings for anyone really and that's obviously a barefaced lie because she's actually still alive but yeah really cool it's one of Bleach's most famous relationships I would say the Gein and Matsumoto storyline because it plays out from beginning to end over the course of a lot of chapters though don't get me wrong um it's easy to forget about it but it's very powerful when it comes to a head at the end of the Arankar arc and Gein is obviously sad that he couldn't get back what Aizen stole from Matsumoto. So no matter what you think about Gein's motivations or how he went about executing them, that relationship is really powerfully done in my opinion. And it's cool as well to see another side of Matsumoto. This relationship gives her additional depth as well because for the majority of the series she's kind of just seen as like this fun loving kind of like goofy lazy doesn't really like working character who has nothing to worry about but there's always been this more somber side to her which is intrinsically linked with Gein and I always really like that. Like I said Gein doesn't really have that many relationships. His vice captain Izuru I, they think they kind of share almost like a shared respect for one another. Izuru is obviously very uh, loyal to his captain to the point where he will allow he almost allow himself to be manipulated into their plan which again kind of tells you that maybe Gein doesn't care about him that much the fact that Izuru ends up fighting Matsumoto and feeling terrible about it 
Um, but when Izuru starts fighting uh, in the fake Karakura Town arc, Gein is obviously like, oh, I'm glad he's doing well. And it's, it's As with everything Gein says, it's really hard to tell if he's being sarcastic or if he's telling the absolute truth that he is pleased about Izuru doing well. I'd see no reason why he wouldn't be, just because he and Izuru must have had some kind of partnership. But really, Gein's only other major relationship that I think we can get into is that with Aizen. As essentially the two main villains for the first two thirds of the story, Gein and Eisen's relationship plays out very interestingly because they're both very similar people, but also very different people. And I think it's also very obvious from the start that Tozen is just simply not on the same level of understanding as the other two of them. It's very much the Eisen and Gein trio, and then Tozen is kind of like left behind a bit. Uh, and that's because Eisen and Gein understand each other on a level that no one else really does. They're both very tricky people who have pushed a lot of people away purposefully for their own reasons. Eisen is obviously because he's on this idealistic crusade to become king of the entire world, and Gein because he's very single-mindedly trying to take out Eisen. So they have a very interesting dichotomy between the two of them. Gein seems to be able to understand Aizen on a level that no one else can. Even people like Momo, who profess to know Aizen well, don't know his true self. But Gein does. Gein's privy to that information um, in a way that I don't honestly think anyone else is. And I think Aizen saw Gein as a genuine protege. Um, not necessarily a successor, but somebody who he could at least rely on. Now, Eisen doesn't trust people. He says that trust is for weaklings and that they have no use for it. But he certainly sees Gein as somebody to be proud of, someone he's, you know, responsible for in a way. Gein's always been Eisen's number two, even back when he was his vice captain. Eisen recruited him into the fifth division and bumped him up to third seat after he had him kill the other one. And they've always been this evil dynamic duo, essentially, who are, you would always assume we're out for the same thing, but obviously it turns out they're not. I think they have a really interesting relationship that's just unfortunately not explored enough, but you know, you do get some great moments like where Gein says, oh, you seem to be enjoying what's going on. Those those guys are beating up the Espada, they're getting closer to us every day. This is during the Wake Commando arc, and uh, I feel like you're enjoying this, and Aizen's like, enjoying it. Is that is that how I appear to you? Well, you're not wrong, you know, I feel something like that. And these are two guys who can't talk about emotions and like normal people, because they don't experience them like normal people. Aizen sees himself as a being above everyone else, and therefore shouldn't be feeling like regular emotions, and Gein obviously keeps everything about himself very close to the chest, but... I think it's that it's that mutual secrecy or that mutual misunderstanding that helps them to understand each other far better than anyone else possibly could. In a way, they're almost like brothers or father and son. I find it very interesting. I always have. I love their relationship, and they are obviously two of my favorite characters in the series. Um, and I feel like it was always going to come to a head in some way. They're, they're, they, you, you, you get every now and then moments between them where... They, they, they exchange a couple of words and it seems to get more heated as the arc goes on. Like towards the end of the Iran arc, Eisen's like, oh, you've, you know, have you been enjoying yourself spectating over there, Gein? And Gein's like, I wasn't, I wasn't spectating. I just didn't see a chance to, uh, to dive in. And that sort of thing I always found to be really interesting. When they get to the Karakura town, I feel like Gein starts to realize he might be out of his depth a bit. Like when Eisen destroys Kotatsu, the big train thing in the Dango. Gein's like, okay, that's... I ba Gein basically becomes out of his league because Aizen insulates himself even further at that point. If they did share any kind of modicum of mutual respect for one another, it's definitely down the drain by the time Aizen fuses with the Hogyoku because at that point he obviously feels he needs no one else. Um, and Gein gets worried about that. You know, he obviously is like, I am maybe am out of my depth here now. I don't know entirely, but... Yeah, either way, I always found their relationship incredibly, incredibly captivating. I thought, obviously, two of them, they're two of Kubo's best characters, in my opinion. Um, and it is this relationship of constant mistrust, but at the same time, some kind of mutual understanding of each other on a deeper level than certainly, like, Tosin could ever understand. Tosin is, like, an underling, like, Shinji calls him an underling. Um, but Gein and Aizen have very much, have always been... They're doing their own thing, essentially. I always found it to be really interesting. 
Whew, all right, guys, that is it pretty much for this video on Gein Ichimaru. I hope you've enjoyed this analysis video. Let me know in the comments below uh, what you think about Gein as a character as well. Do you enjoy him? And uh, what do you think about his death scene in particular and his relationship with Aizen? Those are the two areas um, I'm really interested in finding out what you guys think. Don't forget to vote as well, guys, on one of the three characters I'm going to leave in the comments below. And we can get started on the next character analysis video. And uh, I hope you'll be there for that as well. Alright guys, but until next time, I shall catch you later. See you then.